Hey everybody, it's Zach Humphrey with Public Proclaimer Ministries, and we're in my office. Uh, so I've been wanting to do a video for a while on my theological library. Um, uh, one thing I think that's really important is for students of the Word to be students of learning. And uh, I know that after I was converted and saved, I wanted to learn everything. I wanted to learn about science. I wanted to learn about logic or reason or truth in all subjects. And I think one of the greatest subjects, period, that there is to understand is theology. Uh, I remember whenever I was a new student of Jesus, a new disciple, I'd been saved about a year. I was caught up in this sort of contemporary Christianity movement that's love and rainbows and butterflies. And I said it out of a sincere heart, not out of an evil heart, but nonetheless, it was an ignorant statement. And I said, you know, I don't care about theology. I just want to know Jesus. And that, what I meant was I wanted to love Jesus rightly, not just get head knowledge. But you cannot separate knowing the Jesus of the Bible from theology because theology is the knowledge and study of God. So, you know, having right theology would mean you're worshiping the right God. Having wrong theology means you would have another God. So knowing good theology and studying after great biblical authors from the past or Christians, uh, I think is very important in developing your Christian walk. Some people sort of get this religious, pharisaical spirit and say, you know, they'll proudly say, you know, all I read is the Bible. And if you read anything else, then you're, you know, uh, you're an idolater or, you know, you're a false convert or something they'll say. But, you know, I never hear these same people say you shouldn't listen to preachers. So, you know, one thing about being humble is being able to be teachable. And some people who will never take advice from other preachers or never take advice from other writers from the past or Christians have a proud spirit. So really being humble is being able to be taught by other people. And just like you listen to a sermon on Sunday morning, it's the same thing as reading authors from the past. The book is nothing more than a sermon really on paper. Uh, that's why listening to maybe music can be dangerous or depending on what they're preaching through their music or through media like television or radio. What people are preaching will influence your mind. So I think one really important skill to develop, one discipline to develop, is being able to read Christian authors, especially those from the past, to be able to develop our Christian journey for today. So uh, my appeal to you, if you're one of those who say, I read the Bible and that's it, is that, well, do you listen to other preachers? Do you take advice from other Christians? And I'm sure if you have any wisdom at all, you'd say yes. So why don't you read books that are written by other Christians? Let the Holy Spirit guide you. And the Bible is the number one. If I don't have time much in a day, I'm not going to read other books. I'm going to spend time in the Word of God. The Bible is precedent and most important. And if I find anything in a Christian author that isn't biblically based, the book is in the trash. So, But I do read other Christian authors to help me grow and mature as a Christian, to help develop me. The Bible says there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. So a book, a shelf of books, is a shelf of counselors. Uh, books are nothing more than the mind of authors. And so uh, I want to have lots of godly counsel. So uh, this is my theological library as it is right now. It's always developing. I've always got books coming in the mail, it seems like. My wife is always getting on to me about buying too many books. So uh, sometimes I have that issue of buying too much books. But... Um, I love books, love reading books. Uh, just a testimony of what God did in my life before I was saved. Um, whenever I was in middle school and high school, I developed a great desire for reading. Uh, but books I read in the past were, uh, I developed a desire for war books, uh, journals from soldiers from World War II, uh, maybe historical works on World War II. World War II was really an interest of mine. Uh, especially the various battles, the Battle of the Bulge, D-Day, Market Garden with the 101st Airborne. So I developed a habit of desiring to read books. And then whenever I got saved, God redirected that new desire he'd given me throughout those years of reading books, big books on war, to learning about spiritual warfare and reading theological works. So uh, God developed in me, which is not common for people in our present age to have a desire to read. Well, he developed in me a desire to read before I was saved. And after I was converted, uh, he redirected my interests from war books 
uh, to learning theology and studying after biblical authors from the past. So I just wanted to take a make a 20 or 30 minute video somewhere around there on uh, my theological library as it stands and just offer some various opinions. This is an anti-Calvinist theological library. I know on YouTube, it seems like every theological library video you watch are from Calvinists. Uh, so I hate Calvinism, it's false teaching. And we don't have time right now to get into all the details, but my, my library is anti-Calvinist. Uh, I have Calvinist authors in my library, like Calvin himself or Piper, MacArthur, but I don't read them because I think they're right. I read them to expose their uh, wrongness and to critique them. So uh, this is a non-Calvinist library. Most of my writings in this uh, theological library are from the 1800s. Most of them are either new Calvinists from the New England theology movement uh, in the Second Great Awakening or uh, Methodist. Um, a lot of Presbyterians, but non-five-point non Presbyterians. So we're just going to go from shelf to shelf, I suppose, and uh, just kind of go over the works that I have uh, in my theological library. So uh, when you look at the top shelf of this first shelf here, here's all my World War II books. Uh, if you're interested in World War II, the Alamo and the Ardennes is good, Longest Winter. These are about the Battle of the Bulge. Um, John C. McManus is a wonderful, and Stephen Ambrose are wonderful World War II authors, so they'll greatly bless you if you're interested in that. Here's the first book I ever read whenever I was in middle school that got my desire for reading books, The Bedford Boys, Bedford, Oklahoma, and D-Day, and how a lot of their sons were killed in action on D-Day, and kind of the story of those guys and, and there in the town. So, uh, well, first we're going to see Fletcher's Checks, the first and second volumes of Fletcher's Checks to Antinomianism, and then an equal check to Phariseeism. Fletcher was a, really a discipler of John Wesley, uh, an influencer of John Wesley, and Wesley highly looked up to Fletcher in his holiness writings. John Wesley said of John Fletcher, he was the holiest man Wesley ever knew. Uh, Fletcher wrote some fiery literature against antinomianism. Uh, for those who know what antinomianism is or doesn't, it's the gospel of no law, anti-nomos, no law, or anti-law. So uh, Fletcher checked that with his writings because there was a great movement of universalism and, and Calvinism in his day, which has really got antinomianistic flares to it. So uh, he checks that. And he also wrote his second volume against Phariseeism uh, to bring the spirit back from just being legalistic. So uh, wonderful works. I personally uh, have not gotten through these works yet, though I have been influenced by them. So uh, I look forward to reading those in the future. I have more books, it seems like, in my library that I haven't read than I have, but we're always making progress. So uh, here is a uh, two-volume set, Harold Bag Begbie on William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. Uh, this is an exhaustive work, as you can obviously tell. These are large volumes on uh, the William Booth, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army. For those who know the Salvation Army today, it isn't what it was. The Salvation Army was an open-air movement in London uh, to bring about revival in London whenever it was uh, fallen. Uh, so William Booth, their slogan of the Salvation Army is soup, soap, and salvation. They were fiery Holy Ghost preachers. They did not believe Calvinism. They taught moral government atonement, and they taught uh, wonderful holiness doctrine. Him and his wife were influenced by Charles Finney's theology. Uh, Catherine Booth read Finney's theology when she was like a teenager, and uh, we'll get to Finney's works here in a little bit down the ladder, but uh, they had good theology, and so their movement prospered. Um, moving on, here's uh, a signature in the cell by Stephen Meyer, a modern-day creation scientist who's one of the best in the business right now uh, for combating evolutionary theology or evolution period and exposing it as, as false and the false theory that it is. Uh, Mason Spiritual Treasury, Morning and Evening. Uh, believe it or not, uh, I, one of my best friends is a Calvinist. Uh, I consider him one of my best friends. 
who lives in Tennessee, and uh, he's influenced me in my earlier Christian walk and, and theological passion. He owned a, um, a Bible museum at one time, and he told the story of how we got the English Bible and the Reformation. So some of my works I have here are from Reformed authors due to his influence of giving me books and things like that. So, you know, there are some Reformed guys that are saved. I'm just kidding. You know, I have, I'm not saying if you're a Calvinist, you're going to hell, but your theology is demonic. Uh, but I, you will see some Calvinistic influence in my in my library here. Uh, going down to the second shelf, uh, here is Albert Barnes' full New Testament commentary, known as the Popular Commentary on the New Testament, uh, from obviously Matthew to Revelations. Uh, Albert Barnes was a great, great uh, 1800s uh, theologian in the Presbyterian Church, I believe, and uh, he wrote wonderful works. His New Testament commentary is excellent. And uh, I highly recommend it for the most part. Um, I think he was inconsistent in some areas, but overall I recommend Albert Barnes' commentary on the New Testament as well as Henry Cowell's, C-O-W-E-L-S, New Testament commentaries. Uh, you're going to get uh, great theology out of that. In fact, Albert Barnes was tried at one point for heresy from a sermon on Romans where he challenged whether or not original sin was taught in Romans 5 or not. So... Uh, Albert Barnes was acquitted of, of, of supposed uh, charges of heresy uh, in his defense of his interpretation of Romans chapter 5 especially. So uh, his interpretation or his uh, commentary on Romans is key, uh, key theology. Looking on down here, we have Martyrs for the Truth. This is the story of the Scotland's persecuted uh, back in the day, in the 1700s and such, uh, the, uh, the Scot Scottish Covenanters and their stories of their uh, martyrdoms for the truth. Hudson Taylor uh, was the leader of the China Inland Mission uh, missionary movement. Hudson Taylor's book right here, um, The Man Who Believed God, one of the best uh, books I've ever read, period. My Calvinistic uh, brother in Tennessee gave this to me. So uh, this is such a wonderful, been a, such a blessing to my life. Uh, one good thing about reading books about the lives of other Christians is you get to learn about how they live, the way they discipline their Christian journey. And you can learn a lot from learning about somebody else's life. So whenever I go through some theological works and I'm starting to get kind of dry on studying theology, I'll go back and read an autobiography or a biography of a great saint from the past to uh, maybe uh, bless me and encourage me for the day. Uh, the life of Miss Booth, uh, right here, the wife of, of William Booth, Salvation Army. This is her testimony and kind of a book about her life. Bringing in the Sheaves, another book from a preacher in the past. Uh, holiness and Power by A.M. Hills. A wonderful book I have there on holiness and sanctification. He was a student of Finney at Oberlin University in the 1800s, as well as a student of Asa Mahan. So um, A.M. Hills is a great writer. He may be differed from Finney in some areas of his views of sanctification. I think they're pretty well similar, though, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the infilling of love from above and, and that holiness and, and consequent happiness and Christian joy is a life of victory over sin, not daily sinning as the false Calvinists would teach. Uh, so, great work, Holiness and Power by A.M. Hills. Um, as we go on down here, we have... A book on the Welsh Revival, I Saw the Welsh Revival by David Matthews. A uh, wonderful book on the revival from Wales. My library contains a lot of revival literature, as you'll see. Uh, I read a lot of revival literature. It's a great blessing. R.A. Tories, How to Bring Men to Christ. Um, a bit of my testimony as a preacher, whenever I was first called to preach, God used a book from R.A. Torrey uh, called Revival Sermons to influence me with a sermon he had on the fear of man. So R.A. Torrey, an open-air preacher, believe it or not, from the past, God used for today uh, to show me and use to call me to uh, the ministry of preaching the gospel. Uh, Basil Miller's book on Charles Finney, just a little tiny uh, biography of Finney's life. Uh, a Serious Call to ha uh, a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Uh, William Law's Serious Call. Uh, John Wesley uh, ranked this book as one of the most important books of his uh, Christian journey and, and, and a book that influenced Wesley very greatly. So, uh, you know, anything that Wesley recommends, I'm just about going to pick up and read as, as he was a holy man of God. 
uh, just some related kind of non-important work there. Conscience and Its Work, a book on the consciousness of man by T. Baird, a great work on the function of the, of the human conscience in the conversion of the soul in the Christian life. Archibald Alexander's Moral Science. Uh, whenever you look in my works here, you're going to see a lot of philosophy, mental philosophy as well as, well as moral philosophy. Uh, philosophy and theology are kind of like wedded to a ring. Bad philosophy will ultimately lead to bad theology. That's why, like, uh, for example, Oberlin and, you, and back in the day, Asa Mahan and Finney uh, elevated a great uh, philo philosophical teachings. And good philosophy, good logic will lead to good theology. Bad a discarding of philosophy or discarding of logic uh, will lead to bad theology. And if a movement claims you shouldn't use logic to understand theology, then you should probably disregard that movement. I know that in my debates with a lot of Calvinists throughout the past, personally, uh, they seem to act as though it is satanic to use uh, to use your uh, logical powers to understand theology. God's not anti-logic. God wants us to use logic. Logic's inborn into the mental faculties of man. We're to use it, not disregard it. So moral science is kind of the science of morality uh, from Archibald Alexander, Presbyterian minister there. Uh, With Christ in the School of Prayer by Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray, great holiness writer. Uh, I have several books on prayer in here that are great blessings. The Love of God by Matthews. This is kind of a little Nazarene writing here. Uh, excellent book on the love of God. Thinking Youth's Greatest Need, just a little cheap book I bought on, uh, got from a brother, uh, that, and the book is all about faith by Gilbert, Thinking Youth's Greatest Need, and it challenges kind of the modern day college students' mindset that, um, that uh, you know, they search for all this truth everywhere, but they disregard the function of faith and the nature of man. Gnosticism, The Path of Inner Knowledge, is kind of a book that uh, is a, kind of like a little historical summation of the Gnostic movement, which is the roots of Augustinianism, Reformed theology, Calvinism, Lutheranism, is Gnosticism, the root of it. So understanding Gnosticism is important to understanding Augustinianism or Calvinism, since they got their theology basically from Augustine, who was a converted Manichaean. Another video for another day. But uh, understanding Gnosticism is important. Here's one of the best books I've ever read on the life of John Wesley. Uh, Coke and More, Life of John Wesley. This is not an original 1793 copy, but it's a, it's a book that uh, was about John Wesley's, uh, John Wesley's life from life to death. Uh, that's the best book I've read on the life of John Wesley thus far. Uh, the Secret of True Revival by Charles Fairbain, and this is uh, Fairbain's Methodist. The Free Methodist Church was Fairbain's church he was a part of um, whenever he felt that the Methodist Church was collapsing already back in the day, much less today. But this book is on the necessity of love, the necessity of preaching holiness, and the necessity of living holiness to experience true revival today. Uh, I've not yet read this book, but this is Charles uh, Babington's Practical View on Family Life and Education, Family Education. So I think that that'll, that'll serve a good purpose, especially as my son gets older. Uh, here's an Albert Barnes book, uh, back in the day, 1857 original copy, The Church and Slavery. So this is the church's position on slavery, uh, printed in Philadelphia in the 1857 by Dr. Uh, Professor Albert Barnes, who is the same author of my New Testament commentary here. Uh, that'll be exciting to read because back in the day there was a great divide over the nature of the church's view as to slavery. Of course, this he's writing from an anti-slavery position, and that's obviously what I hold. So that'll be interesting to read. Here's the New Testament of thoughts given to me by my Calvinist brother, uh, that uh, Jonathan Edwards Jr. played a part in right there. Uh, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Edersheim. Ed Edersheim, I think you're saying it correctly there. Volumes 1 and 2. My Calvinist brother gave me that as well. Billy Sunday, The Man and His Message by Ellis. Uh, great autobiography, biography there of uh, Billy Sunday. Great revivalist from the past. Uh, I do not like this book. Obviously, this is Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, another person gave this to me when I was fairly new in Christianity, thinking it was going to be a blessing to me, though they were ignorant of the theology of it. The great controversy between Christ and Satan, it's there, but I'm not it's trash theology. 
But uh, nonetheless, there it is. Uh, the Soul Winning Sermons by R.A. Torrey was the book God used to call me to the ministry. Uh, this book right here, uh, Torrey's Sermon on the Fear of Man, God used that greatly. R.A. Torrey's writings, good writings. Uh, here's a view um, on the uh, Reformation work here given to me by my Calvinist brother. The scriptural doc, uh, one thing you're going to see here too as we go along, uh, I have a lot of writings on the atonement. Here's some, some Bibles here, uh, uh, old, uh, old Bible there, an old, a couple of old Bibles. Here's a Bible that actually my same, the Calvinist brother I'm telling you about, uh, he binds Bibles and he rebound this Bible for me. This is a Bible I carried for a while. In fact, this is a Schofield, uh, Old New Testament Scriptures. Uh, let's see how old. This is a 1909 copy, I believe it is. Um, let's see here. 1917. So this is a 1917 copy, Schofield Bible that's been rebound. Beautiful rebinding work the guy did. Excellent, beautiful, multiple colored tabs. Uh, he's not really doing the binding much anymore right now. Otherwise, I'd recommend him to you, but... Uh, what a blessing he did. And that's the original tab from the old uh, outer calf skin skin that was on it before he rebound it for me. Uh, Wade and Wanting by D.L. Moody, great revivalist preacher, life of David Livingston, great missionary from the past. Um, uh, another book by that same Calvinist brother, The Letters of Samuel Rutherford. Wonderful writings nonetheless. I'm not a Calvinist, but I have been blessed by some Reformed thinkers from the past. Uh, the Scriptural Doctrine of Atonement by Caleb Berg. This is an Open Air Outreach copy reprinted by Jesse Morell of Open Air Outreach. Highly recommend this theological work on the atonement. It's uh, the nature, necessity, and extent of it. And this is going to push forward a, uh, a moral government, governmental atonement theory rather than a penal substitution theory or the ransom theory of the Pentecostals. Uh, you're going to get a good theory, a good solid atonement literature here. Only 120 pages, easy read. Highly recommend this uh, theological work. Here's Always Ready by B Bonson, uh, Calvinist apolog apologist from the past. Great literature. Uh, being an open-air preacher, uh, learning good apologetics is essential. Got this copy on Amazon. Great read. How to Win Souls and Influence People by Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is an open-air preacher out west in California. Um, wonderful writings there on a, kind of the, a fiery book on being evangelistic. Sermons from the Penny Pulpit by Charles Finney. This is a copy from Open Air Outreach, Jesse Morell. Uh, Finney sermons, uh, any of them you read are going to challenge you, mature you, and grow you as a Christian. So I can't recommend enough reading a Finney sermon. Sometimes even a Finney sermon once or twice or three times a week will keep your mind and theological brain churning and a desire for holiness always building. The Atonement in Christ by John Miley, The Atonement by Albert Barnes, The Atonement by Nathan Beeman. These three works, essential good works on understanding the Atonement of Christ. Uh, I will make a special bug for The Atonement by Albert Barnes. This is probably the best book, one of the best theological works I have ever read, period. Leonard Ravenhill put this book at the top of his list of theological works. The Atonement by Albert Barnes. This came from Jesse Morell's Open Air Outreach uh, website, book uh, website. Uh, so you can get this book for like $15. If I could recommend one theological work in my library today, this would be one of the top ones uh, right here. The Atonement by Albert Barnes. Uh, the Natural Ability of Man by Jesse Morell, an excellent work. It's like a 600-page book on the freedom of the will. A uh, wonderful book on the liberty of the will by Jesse. Are Men Born Sinners by Alfred T. Overstreet. This book is wonderful in knocking down the foolish doctrine, the false doctrine of original sin. Original sin is a false doctrine. I don't have time to get into it now. It's taught by Augustine. Uh, I hold to a form of original sin that each man originates his own sin. I think this is what the Bible plainly teaches that we have a natural corruption from Adam, not a moral corruption from Adam. We have predisposition to sin because our nature is temptable, just like Jesus had. Nonetheless, Jesus didn't choose to sin, whereas mankind has. So I deny original sin as taught by Augustine and most of the Western church. These two books right here are good at knocking against that false doctrine. Objections to Calvinism as it is by Randolph Foster, a great little apologetic book against the Calvinists. This is a copy from Jesse Morell's Open Air Outreach site. Excellent book on uh, combating against uh, Calvinism. 
Right here we have, uh, I have a little mini book, a reprint from John Wesley. Uh, let's see here. Uh, an extract of the Christian's pattern or a treatise on the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, reprinted by Wesley, 1850. So this is a little, a little uh, extracts from Imitation of Christ by Kempis, and uh, this is a gathering of it by John Wesley, 1850. Great little, great little book there on the Imitation of Christ. Joseph Butler's Analogy of the Christian Religion. Uh, this is an excellent work um, by Joseph Butler. It's an original copy here. I don't always buy the original older copies, but when I find good deals on eBay, I may purchase it or I may pick up an original copy. It's one of the oldest books I got in my library here, 1796. Uh, this was greatly influential and influenced the English thought. Whenever they were falling into a state of atheism, Joseph Butler's defense of God, of personal identity, and of the nature and virtue of serving God. Uh, by Joseph Butler. So, great defensive work of the faith uh, back in that time in, in human history. Uh, as we go on down here to the bottom shelf of this uh, case, uh, we're going to pick up uh, some Finney works here. Uh, this is an early copy of Finney's Lectures on Revivals of Religion. This is an 1800s copy I have there. Best works on revival I think you can read are probably Finney's. If, if I could recommend one revival work you need to read, it's probably Finney's Lectures on Revivals of Religion, followed by Finney's Memoirs on Revivals of Religion. Here is a Reformed Writings, a, a, a collection of Reformed sermons from preachers from Connecticut back in the 1700s. Uh, good, some good sermons there. I picked this one up mainly because it had a sermon on the government of God. Uh, which I thought was excellent. Here's a gathering of sermons by Joseph Clark, another uh, early Christian author in American history and his sermons and works. He was a good holiness uh, writer. Here's an interesting book I've yet to read, though I, I'm excited to read it. It's Universalism, Examined, Renounced, and Exposed. This guy who wrote this book was a former universalist uh, back in the uh, 1800s, who forsook universalism and got back to orthodox true Christianity uh, by Matthew Hale Smith. Uh, 1842 copy, Universalism, Examined, Renounced, and Exposed. Like I said, I've yet to read this, so I can't say I 100% recommend it. Uh, but the, the description is, The testimony of, un of universalist ministers to the dreadful moral tendency of their own faith. So that sounds really powerful. I'm excited to read that book there. Uh, Roland Allen's Missionary Method, St. Paul's or Ours, given to me by my Calvinist friend. Personal friend I know. Does God really answer prayer? And uh, Be Not Deceived by Reverend Roger A. Curtis, a missionary, I believe, to Mexico. Um, so there's his two personal books he had printed. Uh, Sodom Had No Bible, a classic from Leonard Ravenhill, of course. Everyone's probably heard that if you know anything about theological writings. Uh, Principles of Prayer uh, by Finney. Principles of Discipleship by Finney. Uh, two excellent works by Finney on the Principles series he had. Here's some little uh, mini books I have here. I disagree with uh, Hugh Ross's views of evolution in the Bible, but uh, here's a good writing on what Darwin didn't know. Uh, here's Gordon C. Olson. Gordon C. Olson was an early 19, kind of 1900s writer and mid 1900s moral government theology writer, and he had a little mini series here, "The Moral Government of God" by Gordon Olson, "The Entrance of Sin into the World" by Gordon Olson, and "Holiness and Sin" by Gordon Olson. Highly recommend these works. Uh, there's Finney's Memoirs writing there that I recommended earlier. That's a print from Jesse Morel of Open Air Outreach. Uh, as we get down here, we have the Confessions of St. Augustine. Augustine's theology is trash, but understanding the trashness of his theology goes back to understanding his life. And uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine I own for that purpose alone. I bought this at like a used bookstore for 2 or $3, so I uh, picked up that. Uh, the Moral Science uh, by uh, Boston, um, Wayland and Boston. Uh, Moral science is really important. It's kind of a part of the right philosophy is understanding the formation of morality. Um, so Francis Whalen's Elements of Moral Science. I know that I think Finney uh, makes mention of this writing within his theological works once or twice. I picked this up at a used bookstore as well. 1841 copy. 
Um, mental Philosophy by Joseph Haven. Great mental philosophy work from the past. I do enjoy studying philosophy. Um, and it's a great work on the mental faculties of man. Here's another mental philosophy book by uh, uh, a writer. I'm not going to get out of the packaging now, but I do have several works. Here's, here's one of Paley's theology. William Paley was a, a philosopher uh, from the past. Uh, and this is his book on natural theology or the study of God from the nature that he has created. Uh, so Pay, William Paley's Natural Theology. Uh, I highly recommend this book. This is a copy, an original copy, as well as his History of Paul the Apostle, printed by the American Tract Society. Uh, I love studying nature when it's referenced to God. Uh, atheistic nat nat natural studies is almost pointless. So studying the philosophy of nature from a uh, kind of a creationist perspective, I think is so exciting. It's so uh, just, uh, ble it's such a blessing to know God from his creative works in nature. And uh, seeing God in as revealed in nature, I think is super, well, super important. Uh, putting all these works back on its shelf here. That way I don't make a mess. Uh, one thing I will say, leave in the comments uh, as to what maybe theological works you've read that have blessed your Christian journey and uh, what you may recommend to me uh, to read as a student of theology and a, and a, and a book owner, reader, studier, etc. I was given this historical like a study of history. It's from a, an atheist, so I don't even recommend it. Drury's, Drury's General History of the World. Trash. Don't read it. Uh, here's Paley's Political and Moral Science, original 1830s copy. It's in really rough condition, so I'm not going to get that out of the package. Uh, and here is a very, very, very early copy of Finney's Systematic Theology. Uh, it's Finney's Theology, printed in uh, like 1846, I believe it was, 1840-something, uh, from Oberlin Press in Oberlin, Ohio. The college Finney was a lecturer at for some time in president. So, um, highly recommend Finney Systematic Theology. Got an original copy or an early copy, I should say, for like an unabridged copy. Uh, it's an abridged copy from the 18, uh, early 1800s. His full works, the 1851 London edition, uh, that's the one I really recommend for the fullness of his writings. But that's a really early copy, and for 30 bucks, I couldn't help but purchase it. Heart Talks on Holiness with Samuel Logan Bringall, uh, Salvation Army writer. Uh, once saved, always saved. The doctrine of deadly deception. This was from a personal friend that lives in Texas, who's a Methodist preacher. He wrote that book. Um, a Bible in Every Hand and for Every Heart by Michael Grant. This is the actual Calvinist author I'm talking about and museum owner. This is a personal book he wrote. Uh, here's some little works here. Uh, Walking in the Spirit by Jed Smock. Wonderful uh, theological work on Romans six, seven, and eight. How to pray the uh, how to pray uh, a little extracts from John Wesley Baxter's dying thoughts and here's a two volume work on Hudson Taylor's life uh, highly recommend this two volume work by Hudson or for on the life of Hudson Taylor by uh, let's see who wrote this work again I actually have forgotten the growth of the soul. Uh, it says Mr. and Miss Howard Taylor. I'm not sure the author of this work. I don't want to get all into that really individually at this time. But this two-volume work, if you ever see this on Hudson Taylor's life, I have two copies of it actually. Uh, this is an excellent work on the life of Hudson Taylor, the leader of the China Inland Mission. And so we get over here. Here's just some little books uh, I got recently. Just random works on preaching, holiness, uh, faith, soul winning. Um, the Christian view of the world and such. Swinging up here, top shelf. I don't read this anymore for any learning ability. J. Vernon McGee, this is the first commentary I ever purchased when I was a new Christian um, through the Bible commentary. Uh, here's just a random life in the spirit, KJV Bible. Uh, uh, Baring S. Gould, or S. Baring Gould's The Evangelical Revival, excellent work on revivalism in America and such. 
The Story of Religion in America by William Sweet. William Sweet was a historical writer uh, on the nature of religion, really in American history. So uh, I highly recommend his works. Uh, History of American Revivals by Beardsley, a necessary work on revival in American history. Our Redemption by Noble. I'm not really aware of what all is contained in this writing. I looked through the summaries of it. It's an atonement work. My, one of my favorite subjects, period, is the atonement, so I purchased it on eBay not long ago. It's not really pushing a Calvinistic theory of the atonement, so I was excited to really read that whenever I get around to it. The Church in Earnest, an original copy by J. Angel James. Uh, excited to read that book on really urging the church to a, a life of revivalism. Uh, the Other Side of Calvinism, this is kind of where we're getting into our Calvinist writings a little bit by Vance. The Other Side of Calvinism, exhaustive work on exposing Calvinistic writings. Uh, necessary work, really. If you're going to study the subject of Calvinism, this needs to be in your library. Uh, the Other Side of Calvinism by Vance. Shanks, Life in the Sun and Elect in the Sun, his two-volume uh, two work, uh, really combating the idea of Calvinism. Excellent work on election, excellent work on uh, life, you know, life in the sun. What Love Is This by Dave Hunt, a good modern work against Calvinism. The Reformers and Their Stepchildren by uh, Verduin, uh, good work kind of on the subject of uh, the Reformation's influence on modern man. Two-volume work, Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, of course, these are uh, translated copies as Calvin wrote those in Latin. Uh, these are the English translations. I'm not sure which copy I have or what authors, but these are clear enough to know what Calvin's inst uh, thoughts were. And uh, I've yet to exhaustively read those, but I'm exhaustively entertained for the last four to five years with Calvinist and Calvinist writings. So uh, I'll get around to reading those completely eventually. Um, historical presentation of Augustinianism and, and Pelagianism uh, by G.F. Wiggers. Uh, this is a copy from Jesse Morell's Open Air Outreach site. Um, highly recommend that for a discussion between the subject of Augustinian theology and Pelagian theology. Uh, Pelagianism is kind of a curse word to modern day Calvinism. If you don't affirm Reformed theology, you're automatically a Pelagian. It's basically their way of scaring away anyone. They don't even know what Pelagius' writings were. They have no understanding of Pelagius, period. They just use that as a slander to anyone who isn't Calvinistic. Wesley even said as far as he could tell from Pelagius writings was a holy man. Uh, even Augustine, in writing about Pelagius, noted that he was a holy man. So, um, you know, that, that should make us think. Uh, Does Man Inherit a Simple Nature by Jesse Morrell? Doctrine of the Wheel by Austin Mahan. These are two volume work, ones against original sin. Does Man Inherit a Simple Nature? Wonderful work on the original sin. Doctrine of the Wheel by Austin Mahan. A good defense of the freedom or liberty of the will. Here's some, a few books I have here on science, Christianity and Deed and the Nature of Science by J.P. Moreland. Good work, a really deep work. This is a challenging work here. I, I struggle with this a little bit. I didn't read it in full. Uh, th thousands, Not Billions by Dr. Don DeYoung, a uh, young earth creationist. Wonderful work, especially as a subject of carbon dating and the dating methods that modern day science used to push their supposed theories. Don't Blame It All on Adam by J.W. Jepson here. I bought two of these because got them for $3 a piece on eBay. You could still get those for $3 a piece on eBay. It's an excellent, it's an excellent, I should say, uh, summary work of the theology of Charles G. Finney. It's a modern kind of writing of the theology of Charles G. Finney and Finney Systematic. So uh, J.W. Jepson's Don't Blame It All on Adam is really a must. For $3 on eBay, you need to purchase that for your library, especially if you're entertaining the thought of studying the, the revival theology of Charles Finney. Uh, the Heart of Truth by Finney. Finney's lectures, uh, more lectures from Finney on theological study. Excellent work, lectures on revivals from Jesse Morrell's Open Air Outreach. Primary work on the subject of revival. Lectures on revivals of religion, gotta have it. An auto, a, bi a biography of Charles G. Finney here. Here's Finney's Systematic Theology at a abridged 1878 edition by Revel, or let's see here, by Bethany House. Uh, excellent work there, though it is abridged. It's not the full writing there. 1851 edition, London edition is the full edition. Divine Me Science, Divine Me Science, The Future Contingencies and Necessity here is an excellent work. And we're going to get into a tense subject here for a moment. Uh, that I've been awed uh, by Lorenzo Dow McCabe. 
I've been often slandered, uh, and I think the subject of, of divine knee science or knee science is a slandered discussion. At a minimum, you ought to study uh, the subject of God's foreknowledge, I think it is often assumed. I think most people hold to a paganistic view of the foreknowledge of God, an eternal now perspective, mostly influenced on the church by Reformed thinking and a paganistic thinking and Platonic theology or Platonic views of God. Uh, so here's some of the uh, subject matter of Lorenzo Dow McCabe's um, uh, divine me sense of future contingencies a necessity. So uh, pre-science would be foreknowledge. Knee science would be uh, the opposite, I guess you could say. The, the openness view of the future. I hold to an openness view of God's foreknowledge about the future, that he knows things as a certainty when he's determined things, but they, he doesn't know everything as with absolute certainty. There are contingencies to the mindset of God. There are contingencies to the plans of God that God may cancel prophecies and change things. He knows the future as it is, and he knows the future exactly as it is. And he knows the future as it is in its nature that there are contingencies to the future. Sometimes you see God changing his mind, changing his plans, and doing new things. God is a God who was, who is, and God is a God to come. But he is a God now who hears our prayers, who sees the works of man, who responds even to the actions of man. So I do have some works that I don't affirm everything my authors in my library may hold on the subject of open theism. So I have a few little tiny works on open theism here. Clark Pinnock's, uh, Pinnock and Others, The Openness of God. Uh, and God Changed His Mind by Brother Andrew. An excellent subject on the nature of prayer and openness of God's foreknowledge. God of the Possible by Boyd. Excellent work on uh, open theism, though I really don't affirm much he has to do with today. He's really a progressive and and I'm not really so much for his views. He's really liberal in his thinking, and I'm not so much for that. But his God of the Possible is a good little defense book on open theism. The Descent of Man by Darwin, The Origin of Species by Darwin, and Answers in the Bible by Jacob Trent. Uh, these three works deal with some uh, scientific, obviously, discussion. Uh, Charles Darwin was a pervert. Charles Darwin was a misogynist guy. Charles Darwin thought that mankind was descended of monkeys and did his best to teach that. Uh, so I have his Darwin's works to read, uh, to be able to defend against his works and writings to college students on the public campuses. So a uh, two-volume works there. I will give a shout out. This is a personal friend of mine, Brother Jacob Trent, who's a preacher in West Virginia. If you go to Amazon, search Jacob Trent and his writings, such as Answers in the Bible. He has several writings and books he's published himself. He's a wonderful brother and a young brother. Uh, he's only in his 20s, and he's wrote several books. So um, I highly recommend him. Uh, his heart for the Lord is, is wonderful and is a great, a great blessing here. So let me put this book back on the shelf. All right, going on down, we have the Lime Street Lectures, a series of lectures in the 1800s on the defend, defending Calvinistic soteriology and Calvinistic theology. I'm going to read this as a, it's a defense book for Calvinism, just to understand how they think. Though it doesn't really take much to understand them. Basically, their entire theology is that God's powerful and that God decrees everything that comes to pass. So uh, if you get that down, the decrees of God, which most Calvinists don't even understand today, then you start to understand the theology very plainly. Um, the Scriptural Doctrine of Sacrifice by Alfred Cave. I bought this book recently, I've not read it, but it's a subject, a book on the nature of atonement, the subject of the word atonement, and, and the scriptural sacrifice. I think that'll be an exciting work to read. Moving on down to the next shelf, getting kind of long in this video here. We just have uh, Finney's work here, Jesse Morrell's 1851 edition. We have uh, two volumes here of Gordon C. Olson's The Truth Shall Set You Free, a necessary work on theology. Youth of Flame by Winky Pratt. Pratney. Winky Pratney is a modern-day writer and a really great man of God. Uh, the Bible Expositor's Commentary, a couple Bibles here, different translations. Uh, just have some random theological commentaries here. Don't affirm all of this. This is a decent uh, Romans. Uh, this is kind of Nazarene Church's uh, sort of commentary set. Um, the Nazarene Church's Beacon Bible Commentary, kind of Methodist Nazarene um, theology. The Philosophy of the Plan of Salvation by James B. Walker here. Excellent, excellent work on the philosophy of salvation. The Romans Commentary by Martin Luther. Uh, it's a good theological work to have in your library to understand the thinking of Martin Luther and his transformation uh, to faith alone, so he said. 
Uh, here's some bi more Bibles here. Uh, random works, the utmost for his highest by Chambers, a little English Quran translation. I've read about a third of it in defending the faith against uh, Muslim, uh, Islam. Uh, here's some DVDs, Feast of the Bibles, Genesis History, Rocks and Fossils, uh, good, uh, good studies. Here's some books I got when I was in Bible College at the Nazarene Bible College in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, Watch Word and Song, a biblical book, a book on elements of biblical exegesis, not eisegesis. Uh, exegesis is getting what the scripture says. Eisegesis is looking into the scriptures for what you think it says, essentially. So it's really important to develop good skills of exegetical work uh, or to study the Bible for what it really says. I think it's important to develop that skill. Uh, here's just the lectures to professing Christians, a little book on sermons by Finney. And Whedon, I believe a Methodist on the freedom of the will. Uh, great work. It was kind of, I think it was his response kind of to Jonathan Edwards' uh, necessity of the will. Moving down here, this is a shameful uh, section of mine. These are just modern works I gathered before I really got into deeper theology. You have some books on sexual purity, The Fight of Your Life by Clinton and Laser. This is excellent work on sexual purity when good men are tempted by Perkins. Good work. These two volume works here on sexual purity, every man's battle and every man, God's man. These are good by Stephen Arterburn on sexual purity. Uh, the Reason for God by Keller. It's a good modern work. R.C. Sproul's Holiness of God. Sproul was a, uh, a Calvinist and um, I've read that. Um, here's some more works on more modern people. LaHaye and... And uh, just random, random works. All of Grace by Spurgeon. Only Spurgeon book I got, thankfully. It's a decent work on really elevating grace, but his Calvinistic twisting of it ruins it. Rust Rod, a Revival by Tozer. A wonderful book on Tozer's. One of Tozer's books, I should say. Uh, Exploring Christian Holiness by Taylor's, kind of like Nazarene and Methodist Holiness. Works of John Wesley's, a volume of his sermons. Uh, some more Bibles, a praise and worship book here. Here's an excellent work that I highly recommend. I've yet to get to read it in full. It was a gift I got recently. Uh, a History of New England Theology by Frank Hugh Foster. New England Theology is kind of that new school Calvinism when the Presbyterian Church split, kind of a moral government frame of thinking. So highly recommend it. Praying Payson of Portland. I have his two volumes of works here, his sermons and his memoir, for if anyone have ever heard of Praying Payson. Of uh, Portland, a great minister and holy man from the past. Uh, moving on down, here's just kind of some of my wife's literature. I'm not going to go over any of that right now. I have a uh, four volume set of all of Jonathan Edwards' works here. This is like 80 some bucks I bid on and wanted on eBay. So I got all of Edwards' works here, an 1800s copy of all of Jonathan Edwards' works. So I'll be excited to read into those. Edwards had some good stuff, not so good stuff. Uh, so I, I'm enjoying, I'll enjoy reading those, I'm sure. The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I have interest in learning about Nazi Germany and World War II. I bought this on, on vacation this summer for like $10. So that's just a good, a good thing to have for your World War II studies. A Dictionary of Early Christian uh, Beliefs by Burko. In case you haven't noticed, down here on the bottom, I have all of the early church authors' writings from Hendrickson Publishers. Uh, this is an expensive volume of books. Uh, Antonicene, Nicene, and Post-Nicene Church Fathers. I really recommend the Antonicene Fathers, most important, but I bought all three copies for several hundred dollars. So um, that book really goes along with it to help you kind of study those early church father works. Very important to study the early church fathers. It'll really help you look for the reformed fog that we presently have cast over the Western church by understanding the early church fathers and how they thought. Uh, you know, most people, when they go to Bible college, they learn about theology up to Augustine, but not much past Augustine. But if you look at the theology prior to Augustine, you see how much Augustine corrupted theological thinking. In Darkest England and the Way Out by General William Booth, another wonderful Salvation Army writer, Religion in Colonial America by William Sweet. Uh, he was the same guy that wrote, uh, he's one of the historical writers on religion in America. I enjoy reading his works. Uh, looking on down here, some more of my wife's writings and World War II literature again. Uh, I have a lot of World War II uh, writings here. Uh, down here is sermon books and uh, volumes of sermons that I have. Um, that I, I write a lot of my sermons. Whenever I go to create sermons or preach, I'll write my sermons out on paper. Usually pretty exhaustively, and then I'll chart them in my literature and stuff. 
Um, I'm learning, going through a study of New Testament Greek. So you're going to see on my desk here, a Basics of Biblical Greek by William Mounts. His fourth edition, the newest edition by Mounts. Highly recommend Mounts' his New Testament uh, Koine Greek Studies. This is his grammar and the grammar's workbook that goes with it. So a learning New Testament Greek is essential to your biblical studies. Um, so uh, learning New Testament Greek has been a joy of mine lately. Here's just the vocabulary cards by Mounts on New Testament Greek. Um, on my desk here, the Greek and English Interlinear New Testament by Tyndale House Publishers, a, uh, a Greek and English side-by-side. Uh, -side. Uh, here's some Strong's, uh, Strong's Concordances on my desk there. I really don't use those as much anymore. I use blueletterbible.org for most of my theological study. And Anessa Allen's New Testament, a, a brother in Christ gave this to me. I don't think this is a good translation, really, of the New Testament Greek, but nonetheless, it's sufficient for my present Greek knowledge to familiarize myself with Greek studies. So, in short, that is my theological library. You're going to see, I guess, in summary, a lot of Finney, a lot of Barnes, a lot of uh, Presbyterian, 1800s, New School Calvinism kind of writers. Uh, anti-Calvinistic theology, Methodist holiness theology, uh, writings against original sin is uh, really uh, getting back to the basics of biblical truth kind of works. A lot of revival works you see here. And uh, so I just want to encourage you to maybe share in the comments what theological works you've read that have blessed your life, what you may recommend to me. And uh, I encourage you to deepen yourself by learning theological study. Uh, so God bless you guys. Keep proclaiming publicly that Jesus is king uh, and God bless you.